Now, you want to talk about a dysfunctional family. Take a look at the United States Congress and what they're doing on the debt ceiling. In our family, my husband and I would have taken that credit card. We would have chopped that baby up. Last night, around dinner tables across our country, moms and dads were going over the family budget. They're spending within their means. Families have budgets, they live within their budgets. American families have to deal with this all the time. Uh, it's time that their government dealt with it as well. What is so wrong with giving the American people the opportunity to speak, to say, Congress, you have been out of control. You need to balance your books like all of the American families in this country do. The hair on fire fight happening in Washington right now is fundamentally a debate over whether or not to destroy the economy. And one of the Republicans' favorite ways of trying to distract you from the fact that lots of them are on the yes, we should destroy the economy side of the debate is to make the argument you just heard, to conjure up this fake, erroneous metaphor between individual American households and the macroeconomic policies of the federal government. Families have budgets. They're spending within their means. Now, you want to talk about a dysfunctional family. Take a look at the United States Congress. In your house, you know you got to pay your bills to make things better. You don't have debt ceilings, so the government should have to act just like your house, right? Okay, incidentally, just today, we got a really clear picture of what American household budgets actually do look like. And it is not good. So, okay, Republicans, let's do it. Let's take a look at what an American household kitchen table budget looks like. And let's stop with the make-believe. According to a new study out today by the Pew Foundation, almost a third of Latino households and more than a third of African-American households have either no wealth or negative wealth, which is to say, debt. A third of households in communities of color in this country are living with their own personal debt crisis, complete with their own personal debt ceiling. Or maybe we can think of it as a wealth floor, a floor they just fell through. So while John Boehner laments whether Social Security will be around for his two daughters, he seems unaware that we as a country are resting on an American citizenry that is individually and in their households, not just in terms of what's happening in government, but in their households, the people are experiencing tremendous debt. And we are relying on these people as wage earners and wealth creators, and we will continue to do so. Within a few decades, we will be a majority minority country. Right now, roughly a third of African Americans and Latinos are facing personal debt crises. And those who have accumulated a little wealth are perilously close to losing the small amount they have. The immediate right around the corner future of America is a colorful one. And these people on the bottom of the chart, they are the ones who should be the future job creators. But right now they have no savings, no cushion to sustain them as they would try, for example, starting a business or hiring workers or implementing the new ideas that have always distinguished America. According to the Pew study, the wealth gap, the distance between white Americans and Latinos and blacks, is at a record high. The mid-level white American family is worth 20 times its African American counterpart and 18 times its Latino counterpart. That's one dime in a black or Latino household for $2 in a white household. Now let's be really clear. The wealth gap is different from the income gap. Yes, jobs matter. There is no way that families can pay their debt or begin to save if they don't have jobs. But this wealth gap is also fundamentally driven by public policy. People didn't end up in these circumstances just because they were making bad choices or being irresponsible fiscally. We end up with a wealth problem like this because of choices that were made by our own government. Initially, many black people in America could not own property because they were property. Even after becoming citizens, many were shut out of the post-World War II policies that so successfully created an American middle class. Black veterans in the South were denied benefits under the GI Bill. 
In the 1940s, at least 65 percent of black workers were concentrated in agricultural or domestic work and were therefore unable to take part in Social Security. And the discriminatory implementation of early FHA loans meant that few people of color had the opportunity to buy homes in thriving neighborhoods. And here is the deal with wealth. It grows. It mushrooms. It explodes. And if you are shut out at the beginning, it is nearly impossible to catch up later on. Take this example. If your parents didn't own a home, because they couldn't get in because of the FHA discriminatory behaviors, then they can't take a home equity line to help you pay for college. So you've done the right thing, you've earned your way to college, but you're gonna have to take out a student loan. And now you're starting adulthood with debt. You get a job, if there are some, and you make payments on the student loans, but you have no money left over for a down payment, so you rent. Even when your income rises a bit, it's hard to generate and create wealth. But if your parents were able to buy in to a house with one of those low interest federal loans, if they did tap that equity to help you pay for college, then you start with no debt. And maybe your parents can help out again a little bit with a small down payment on your first home and you start building wealth and the outcomes are so very different. Whole communities cannot just earn their way out of a wealth gap. So let's look at that issue of housing just a bit more. Listen, predatory lending began in black and Latino communities a decade before it was common practice in the American mortgage industry. And remember, we know the value of a house has less to do with how many bedrooms it has or what the square footage is or whether it has granite countertops. The main difference in the value of a house and whether or not that house is an asset that can create wealth for you and your family is of course location, location, location. And the number one locational problem for black folks and Latinos is that they live in neighborhoods that are defined as bad neighborhoods. And they are defined as bad simply because black and brown people live there. Residential segregation may no longer be the law, but it is the reality in much of the country. So when this particular housing crisis hit, it double compounded what had already been true for African Americans and Latinos for so long, making those housing prices fall even more rapidly, causing foreclosures to shoot up and making it even harder to buy into the American dream. So here now you have a system where these groups are being pushed farther to the margins. And these are the people, as we've just seen over the course of the last decade, lose massively whatever small foothold they were gaining. They've been hit hardest by unemployment. We've seen wages go down. They've been hit hardest by the decline in wealth. They've lost income. And now they're the ones who are going to have to pay into our national treasury, to pay into our social security system. And as people of color become a proportionally bigger part of the American population, our national coffers will rely on them even more. We cannot pay off the national debt if households cannot pay off their personal debt. And if they are in debt, then you can't cut enough to ever make it possible to fix our government's debt problems. And particularly not if you refuse to tax that one group whose wealth is still tick, tick, ticking up. Joining us now to talk about this is Dr. Thomas Shapiro, the P.O. Cross Professor of Law and Social Policy at Brandeis University and Director of Brandeis Institute on Assets and Social Policy. Dr. Shapiro, I am such a fan of your work. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you. So from, uh, from what we're seeing right now, listen, those on the right and even a few on the left love to make this comparison between households balancing their checkbooks and the government having to tighten its purse strings. How dangerous is that metaphor? I think it's an extremely dangerous metaphor. I, I think there's no way around the fact that comes out of this latest Q, uh, Pew Center report that the American population is in an absolute crisis if we look at the wealth loss for nearly all households simply from uh, the year 2005 to the year 2009. It's been an absolute wealth loss for everybody. Uh, and, and that means we're talking about uh, what the opportunities for the American dream in the future are for everybody. Within that, however, the dynamics that have hit communities of color and low and moderate income communities, clearly the crisis is even much more devastating. And that's why this Pew report, I think, is really, um, I don't want to call it an alarm bell, the, all the alarms in the city. <laughs> Town should be crying out <laughs> yep. about, about the severe crisis that we're in. 
Dr. Shapiro, one of the things I like most about your work is that you point us towards structural reasons for this. Um, your work really talks about how public policy is at the root of so many of these disparities. So if public policy helped to create these problems, what, if anything, is Washington doing or can it do to address this disparity now? That, that's a great question. You know, I think if we get a really good handle on what has driven the increase in the racial wealth gap in the United States, then we start to have some tools and some handles on public policy that we might be able to, to, to make a redress of, of that particular racial wealth gap. In my mind at this point, um, with, with the Pew Center report, clearly the biggest driver of the increase in the last few years has been the absolute utter crash of the housing market and the foreclosure crisis. And I think that there is a lot that Washington has not done in terms of financial regulation that puts some kind of control, some kind of transparency in, in the business that was going on first in communities of color and then spreading out through other segments of American society. I also think that, that Washington could take a much harder look at what has been, in my estimation, a very anemic policy around foreclosures in the United States, the way that we could help families who are in crisis, those families that look like they could make it through and make those payments or trying to make their home mortgage payments, I think there's a, a lot we can do for them. Well, look, there's one other piece that I've, I've seen you draw attention to before on this question of government and housing, and that is the issue of taxes. Um, look, in our current conversation, we keep talking about taxes as though they are just about income taxes. But talk to me a little bit about how our current tax structure actually widens this gap, makes this problem worse. I think when we look at institutional dynamics, uh, like public policy, to my mind, the, the largest driver here in terms of tax policy are the tax benefits that are given to families to behave in certain ways. There's what I call a wealth budget in the United States tax code, where individuals and families are rewarded by paying lower taxes for doing things that we think is good public policy for everybody. The largest of those, of course, is the home mortgage interest deduction. The second largest one happens to be uh, the taxes that we don't pay if we put money aside for pensions when, when we need to retire. If we add up those, those budgets in the United States, what the taxpayers are paying for incentives so that some people don't pay taxes, it's about $400 billion a year. Now, that $400 billion a year might mean one thing if it were distributed somewhat equitably, but the story is very different. The top 1% of taxpayers receive 45% of the benefits of that wealth budget of the United States government. And if I can use the phrase, the bottom 60% receives 3% of that. I think in terms of policy and in terms of structure, that that is the, the biggest place to start with. And unfortunately, politically, it's also the hardest place to start. <laughs> well, we might as well have the hard answers in the, in the middle of this manufactured crisis. So Dr. Shapiro, I greatly appreciate you taking the time to come and talk with us about this. Thomas Shapiro is the Pocross Professor of Law and Social Policy at Brandeis University. Thank you so much for being here. Again, my pleasure. Thanks.